STEM fans, are you ready? Let's hear it for the world-class NASA STEM Stars team. From NASA centers across the country, we present Dr. Kartik Shed. Welcome everybody to this week's exciting NASA STEM Stars episode. Thank you, Dr. Chef, for being with us today. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. So we're celebrating the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So I'm really happy that you were mm -hmm. able to join us for this special episode. Um, Dr. Chef is from um, NASA headquarters. And I am your host, Jen Hudgens, and just want to welcome everybody to today's show. So, Dr. Chef, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, sure. Um, I am an astrophysicist by training. Um, I was born in Mumbai, India, uh, and I'm sure you're all hearing about India, unfortunately, these days because of the terrible COVID situation. Um, but if uh, we can go to the map of India, I can show you roughly where I was born. I was born on the west coast of India in a little town, <laughs> Mumbai, which is not quite little. Uh, and just, you know, um, with my family, just my mom and dad and my sister, uh, those mountains in the back are not real. They're not in Mumbai. That's our trip to Kashmir when I was about eight years old. And um, I grew up and went in this little suburb north of Mumbai. Uh, to the same school my entire uh, time I was in India. So the school was called Sharon English High School. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see a picture of all of us when we were in elementary school. And uh, this, this, these were just the days that I uh, really relish and miss. Uh, being in India, uh, I went to a school that just had, um, you know, people from all different backgrounds. I'm Gujarati but I went to a Christian school. The language of medium uh, speaking was English, but I spoke Hindi and Gujarati and Marathi. And um, yeah, even today I'm friends with all those, all of those uh, students. In fact, we have a nice picture slide here of us 25 years later, and I'm still in touch with all of those folks. Wow. And uh, yeah. <laughs> So, so many things are going through my head as you're talking. So first of all, I've never been to India. So if you could describe, it looks like Mumbai is on the coast. So did you get to swim? Do you swim in that ocean? Is it flat? Because you said those mountains that were in the picture were, were in a different country. So describe for the viewers that have never been to India, what is it like to grow up there? Sure. Um, so India is in the tropics, so it's always 90 degree temperature and 90% humidity. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved it. I'm always cold in, in the US. Um, uh, it's on the coast. And so it's beautiful seashores. I don't know if you ever really went swimming very much in the ocean there, partly because I didn't learn how to swim till I was almost 10 years old. And it was only because the Asia Games came to India and they built a swimming pool in my town. And so that's when I learned how to swim. And I was, you know, most kids in America probably learn how to swim when they're young, but I actually learned to swim when I was probably 10 or 11 years old. Um, and um, what is it like to grow up in uh, Mumbai? It's a city of 25 million people. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. But the town I lived in, Mulund, was right up against the mountains. And so my memories are uh, going to school, but then coming home and throwing my bag and going to play cricket. Uh, and my mom would always say, no, come do your homework first before you go play cricket. And on the weekends, all of us kids would go get together and we would go uh, to the mountains and just climb, you know, for an hour or two. So it was really idyllic life. I loved my childhood. Um, we didn't have much. Uh, you know, we didn't have a car or a television set or even a phone in, in my house growing up, relatively poor. Uh, but it was just so much fun uh, uh, growing up there. So I think we have several pictures of you speaking of growing up. So we have a, a very adorable picture of you as a baby. 
And then looks like a great, very strong cricket player there in the middle. And then, of course, graduation. So is that graduation from Sharon or was that graduation from uh, university? No, so that's graduation from university. So I grew up in India till I was about 14. And you can see that picture all the way on the left. Um, you know, I had curly hair. Uh, but one day I ran into my uncle who was holding uh, a hot cup of tea and it like scalded me all over the back. Uh -huh. So my mom was very sad that all, all my locks went away. And I had glasses <laughs> since I was very young. So that that picture in the middle is actually on a trip to South India. Uh, my dad was worked in a, neither of my parents are scientists and nobody in my family was a scientist. Um, but I just, I just really was fascinated uh, by science and traveling, both of those things. And so um, that middle picture was me, uh, uh, was me in, in South India. And then the picture on the right uh, is graduation from high school. But what happened was, Ever since I was a kid, I really wanted to become an astronomer. And I, I knew my parents knew I wanted to be a scientist. And uh, when we got a chance to emigrate to the United States, uh, came over when I was 14 years old. So I finished ninth grade in India. And then I did 10th grade in Iowa and 11th and 12th grades in uh, New Jersey. So that picture on the right is me uh, graduating from high school uh, in New Jersey. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the story of those pictures. So you mentioned when you were in India, you didn't have much um, TV and those types of things. So when you moved to America, were there some influences that maybe have steered you towards the astrophysics career? Or tell us about some things, maybe mentors that you had uh, growing up. Sure, actually, yeah, this is a great slide here. So uh, like I said, you know, I had this fantastic childhood, which was pretty idyllic. And what you see on the top left there is the one, we only had one channel and black and white television growing up, right? But the first two television shows from the United States that came to India were Different Strokes, which is in the bottom there, and then Star yeah. Trek. And I, I hope in the YouTube channel, we can put, put the Star Trek uh, uh, video link. And Star Trek was what just completely inspired me. And it would come on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and we didn't have a TV, so I would run around the building trying to find out if somebody would let me watch TV. And I swear I saw every single episode of, uh, of Star Trek and uh, just dreamed about going to, you know, going into space and being an astronaut. Other things that really influenced me is if you go to the next slide, um, one of the things that had a big influence on me was uh, our school field trips. We would always go to the Nehru Planetarium. So this is on the west side of Mumbai. So we would have get in a bus and we would go. And I just remember sitting down on those planetarium chairs. And in Mumbai, you can't see the stars that easily. So it was great to be able to kind of imagine mm -hmm. what the night sky would look like. And as I mentioned, you know, because we, my dad also likes to travel, we would every two years or so we would go somewhere in India. I never, I never left India until I came to America. Um, but just, I was always fascinated with the night sky and what was out there. And then another thing that really happened early on, if you go to the next slide, is this really great book um, of photographs that were collected from the NASA Voyager missions uh, that really had these pictures uh, taking, taking amazing photographs of all the planets and, and moons as the, as the spaceships traveled across the solar system. And I swear, when I was young, I could name every single thing about every single planet. So I was always inspired to want to be an astronaut. And then I had, I had, you know, I got, I had glasses, so I knew I couldn't be an astronaut. So I was like, okay, what's the next best thing? I'm going to try to be an astronomer. Uh, so uh, I think uh, same thing happened to me. To <laughs> same thing happened to me. I was like, I'm going to be an astronaut. And then I was wearing glasses and I knew that was out for me, but I think the <laughs> rules have changed slightly since then, but yeah, both. I know we should go back. Story. We should time travel. That'll be up to you to invent. <laughs> so we've had a question. Um, when did you know that you wanted a career in STEM? Um, very early. So probably when I was maybe seven or eight years old, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Now I didn't like biology. I have to tell you because you know I'm. It just kind of grosses me out. <laughs> you know, like dissecting things. <laughs> so I really, I but I really enjoyed uh, astronomy and, and and physics and chemistry and so I, I that's very early on I knew. But the funny thing is, you know, I didn't really I didn't really decide to become a physics major in college 
until I was almost a junior almost in my second year. Um, so for me, right, our immigration story is a little bit complicated in the sense that we grew up as a family in this wonderful, even though we didn't have much, we were so happy. And then we moved to America. And then the whole family was split apart because oh. my dad came in his 40s, didn't have a lot of money, uh, didn't have an American education. So we really struggled. So my sister ended up going back to India. My dad moved to New York City and lived as a boarder for, for a year. My mom and I lived with my uncle and aunt in Iowa, but then my mom moved to New York. And so I kind of, I was in India in ninth grade and I was in uh, New Jersey in 10th, uh, I mean, I was in Iowa in 10th grade and 11th and 12th grade in New Jersey. So when I got to college, I was just like, breathed the sigh of relief that at least I was gonna be in one place. But I went to a liberal arts college. I went to Grinnell College in Iowa and I'm really glad I went there. I had never seen the college. At that time, we didn't have the internet. We really were um, picking colleges from a brochure and we didn't have any money to go visit it. So I basically chose the college based on an interview for the other alums from the college. Uh, but I learned a lot of great lessons, you know, when I went through that college in those four years uh, and did a liberal arts degree. So um, I really, I just loved it. So one of the key things I learned, which I think was on the first slide also, and I, and I think you will see on this next slide as well. And that's like a message I want to send to the students here today is don't chase success. Don't you, what you need to chase is passion. What do you really love doing? And what this picture shows me is one of my favorite images in the night sky. It shows you the Milky Way on the right-hand side, and it shows you two little blobs on the left-hand side of that image of the, of the telescope there, which are the large and the small Magellanic clouds that you can see from the Southern hemisphere. And there's nothing more exciting to me than looking up at the Milky Way and just imagining what's, and so I've always wanted to do that. And if you chase success, uh, it won't, you, you may not be successful, but if you chase passion, success will follow. It won't feel like a job. So that's my one big piece of advice for the students. I love that. I absolutely love that. It's true. Chase your passion, everything else will fall in line. So we've got a couple questions if we don't mind pausing in your story here a moment. Um, uh, Francis wants to know what is astrophysics? Great question. So astrophysics is the study of the cosmos. Everything from planets that are on our own solar system all the way to the first galaxies and the edge of the universe. So everything in some sense outside the Earth. Now, technically within NASA, we divide up astrophysics as things from beyond the Kuiper belt in the solar system, beyond Pluto, all the way to the edge of the universe. And we have a different division that studies planetary science and a different division that studies the sun and does heliophysics and a different division that studies the earth looking back down. Um, but fundamentally, you know, what we do in astrophysics is we build better and better telescopes on the ground or in space and we collect light. And from that, we try to tell what are planets and stars made of? How did they form? When did they form? How are they going to change? You know, how long do stars and planets live for? How are black holes formed? All of those questions, you know, everything about the cosmos, that's what we try to do in astrophysics. Perfect, thank you. And another question from um, Barry Stone. How did you decide what college to go to for getting your degrees? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, so I really, you know, because we'd only been in America for uh, three years, I really relied on my guidance counselor because you know, my dad went to college, but my mom did not go to college and we didn't have anybody in America who knew about colleges here. So uh, I ended up deciding uh, really based on advice from my guidance counselor and advice uh, and really this interview that I had that I, I chose to go to a small college because I had such a good experience in my first year in America. When I went to New Jersey, honestly, I uh, experienced a lot of discrimination. And as you know, you know, being Asian American or being a person of color uh, is not always easy. And so I wanted to kind of go back to a small place where people would know me and I could feel more like a community. So I'm really glad I went to a small liberal arts college, which had pluses and minuses. And I, I learned a lot of lessons in, in that liberal arts college. But the one lesson I will tell you as students is if you want to be a scientist, don't ignore all the things that are not science related. You have to be a good writer. You have to read. 
you have to be able to collect your thoughts and express them very succinctly and concisely. You have to be able to write well, you have to read and think critically, and you have to communicate effectively. If you can't do that, you can't be a good scientist. You might be able to solve every problem in the world, but science is so much more than just numbers, uh, a numbers game. What matters is really uh, are, are the people who, who make that up. Uh, so that's, that would be my one piece of advice. Along the way, I mean, I can, I can share some of my other slides, Jen, if you don't mm -hmm. mind me talking. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so if you can go to that next slide, uh, I'll just share with the students some of the lessons learned. I would say that one of the key things I'll make 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 sure that you remember is that really have fun. You know, whether in high school or college, make make sure you have fun. It doesn't mean that you don't have to work hard. You have to work hard and you have to play hard. So this picture on the left hand side is our college library, and we would be out, you know, having fun and partying late into the night on uh, say Friday night. But Saturday morning, eight o'clock, we were all at Berlin Library, you know, studying. And then I, I didn't know how to play golf, but I went to a small division three school. So they took anybody and I, 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 got, I was on a golf team. And on the golf team, we had to travel every weekend, but I never, my professors never gave me allowances for that. So I had to juggle, how do I, you know, be an athlete and at the same time do my work. And I think that was a really important lesson. As you go on to be a scientist, you will have to do that. You will have to juggle a lot of things. Um, and so multitasking is really important. And then taking care of yourself. You know, if you have fun, it's something that you're passionate about. It won't feel like work. Exactly. Again, chase your passion, right? Yeah. So we had a question from Madini. She wants to know, um, how did you become successful from your childhood to your current position at NASA? And I think maybe your next slide might even address that question a little bit. Sure. So besides chasing your passion and working hard, um, I think an important thing to remember is make sure that you always find good mentors and hang on to them. So for example, one of the things that happened to me while I was in college in my sophomore year was we had a lot of graffiti that was hateful around campus. And the whole campus was, you know, especially all the people of color didn't feel very good. And, and that, that photograph that you see there is of Dr. Keisha Scott, who held this great workshop where she highlighted kind of, you know, if you're not, if you're from a particular group, whether you're Indian or Latino or black, you're going to live in a world where there's going to be, uh, uh, there's going to be discrimination. There's going to be, uh, there, there might be people saying things that, you know, really don't reflect who you are. And what she taught us is to really you know, find good mentors, find a good community so that you can fight that um, external world around you. And so I can't emphasize enough the importance of finding good mentors and having a good community, having a good support system, which is always going to push you. And then the last, the next slide I'll show you also, which also had a huge influence on me, um, is a picture of my friend, Tammy Zuwicki. So she was in my class from the very first day in my tutorial class, and she was killed my senior year. And I think when I was young, when I was 20 years old, having losing a friend like that had a huge impact on me and all my friends. And we realized life is short. You know, it is, it is, people are the most important thing. So I've always been successful by chasing my passion and doing astronomy, but always remembering what's important are people. Uh, what's important is working hard and playing hard and really making sure that you're not treating science and astrophysics as an end all be all. Um, I think that's part and parcel of chasing passion, but also having balance in your life. That's so great that advice. That does make sense. That's great advice, I think, to everybody that's listening out there. Discrimination is across the board, no matter if you're male or female or whatever you're facing, find good people to surround yourself with. Great advice. So um, let's just go ahead and jump into the waters here and tell us what is it like to be an astrophysicist? Um, well, I couldn't have, I would, if I had to do it all over again, I'd still be an astrophysicist <laughs> uh, because I love sitting and looking at the stars and planets and, 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 you know, what you get to do as an astronomer 
is you get to think about unsolved questions. And in order to answer those unsolved questions, you have to collect data. Now, how do you collect data? Well, unlike a physicist or an engineer or a biologist, you don't have a lab. You can't do things in a lab. The labs for astrophysicists are our telescopes and our observatories. What these telescopes and observatories do, these are all telescopes. There are three of these are radio telescopes and two of them are radio interferometers on the top. And the one on the left-hand bottom is the, is the image from Mauna Kea in Hawaii, where you have optical and infrared telescopes. So what we do is we write proposals and compete for time on these telescopes. That time is precious. And then if you're lucky, um, you know, um, you, 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 and you get you not lucky and and you have to write good proposals you get a chance to go collect data from these telescopes so one of my favorite things about astrophysics is going to these telescopes to collect the data everything we know about the universe comes from collecting light everything that you know from the big bang to black holes to stars and planets is all from us simply collecting photons of light that have traveled across the cosmos only to then die in your detectors where we record them. <laughs> and then we record the light at lots of different wavelengths. And that allows us to tell what the stars and planets and gas is made out of, what is the chemistry of it. And then you try to understand how those things must have come into place. So that's kind of the life of an astronomer is you think about questions. You say, okay, I want to address this question. What is the data I need? I write proposals, I collect the data, and then I analyze the data, and then I write a paper. And then the other great part, which I, we have a slide later on, where uh, the great part, because astro there are very few astronomers in the world, only about seven or 10,000. So you can really tell your mom, if you're an astronomer, you're one in a million, literally. <laughs> and what that allows you to do uh, once you once you be an astronomer is you have to work with the rest of the world because it's a team environment. We all build on each other's work and we travel to conferences to share our results and learn from each other. So that's how astronomy proceeds. So that's in a nutshell what an astronomer does. We had a question from Elena. She wanted to know um, how important is computer science and coding when it comes to astrophysics? Um, it's very important. I mean, I think all of us have to code at some level. I never actually really learned coding in a class. <laughs> I just picked up basic and Pascal and then I'm just a hack. You know, I just kind of learn C++ or Python. A lot of the coding we do nowadays is in Python. And um, a, we do have a lot of software that's already built. So one career path you can take as an astronomer is you can be a data scientist. You can get a PhD or a master's in astrophysics. And because coding is so important for us to collect these very faint signals of light and be able to really understand what they're telling you, and you've written the code to be able to analyze that data, you can then apply it to many different applications, including staying in astronomy and building software packages so people don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. You can, we have software packages that people will use to analyze uh, data at all different wavelengths from gamma rays and x-rays all the way to radio waves. So um, so I think computer science is really important. Uh, astrophysics is the merger of all the different disciplines, right? You need to know mechanical engineering so that not you personally, but somebody needs to so that we can build great telescopes. You need to have really good idea of optics because we need to transfer lots of data over large distances from these remote telescopes to the computers where we store them. You need to be good at data science and computing so that we can analyze the data. You need to be a good writer. You need to be a good reader. So all of those things are, are the skills, you know, so it's kind of like you have to be kind of a jack of all trades in some sense. So I think your next slide addresses more about your research. And we've had some questions from students about your education, which I think this slide will address. So if you could talk a little bit about your path to NASA. Sure. So I went to this small college in Iowa, right? And then I, because I took a lot of liberal arts college, I wasn't very well prepared. So I actually had a little intermediate step where I did a master's in physics and physics education. And then I did another master's and PhD in astrophysics at University of Maryland. Then typically as an astronomer, you go on to do typically a postdoc, a postdoctoral fellowship. That's somewhere between three and six years. And I did that at Caltech in Pasadena, California. And then I immediately got hired onto a permanent position working with the Spitzer Space Telescope. And I never actually worked in infrared astronomy, but again, like I said, you know, a lot of your skills are transferable. 
But that was my first real exposure to working within a NASA center. So if uh, they can put the YouTube link uh, for the Spitzer mission, I was part of that from the day it was launched. Uh, so I was at in Pasadena for maybe you know eight or nine years. And then when the Spitzer mission ran out of cryogen, this next slide shows you what I did next. So the next slide for me was to go and work for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which is uh, which was building, along with other international partners, an amazing telescope called the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile. So I lived on and off in, in, in Santiago, Chile. Uh, oh, if you can go one slide back, please, um, just to show the students what, uh, yeah, thank you. So I, I lived and worked at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in, in Charlottesville, but I really spent a lot of time in Chile. And the map on the left shows you we would fly into Santiago and then we'd have to fly up and then take a two hour bus ride into the Andes Mountain to build this amazing telescope that you can see on the top right. Uh, so I did that for six years uh, and was I, I got tenure, which is kind of a permanent position. And then I decided, you know, I wanted to go do something completely different. And then I, six years ago, came over to NASA to work as a program scientist at headquarters. So what we do at headquarters is we enable the science that the nation is doing. So we bring in proposals, we review them and we fund them, and we decide what missions, what telescopes we want to build and launch in space. Uh, and that's and those telescopes then are used by students and professors and scientists all around the world, not just America, all around the world to do astrophysics. Um, so that's kind of what I do at NASA now at, as a program scientist. I still do a little bit of research. I love understanding how galaxies formed and evolved over all cosmic time. But I also now am working with a small team to take the resources the nation gives us to allow us to enable science all over the all over the world. And specifically, I'm working with the James Webb Space Telescope, which we will show you a nice video of later. Actually, I think we have a few minutes left, so it might be a good time to go ahead and show that now. And then we can tell the students okay. real briefly what that uh, project is about. Uh, it's, I it always makes it raises the hair on my skin, you know. Um, that is the James Webb Space Telescope that I work on. We're going to launch this incredible observatory. It's six meters in diameter into space, and it won't orbit the Earth. It will go to L1, the Lagrange point, and it's the successor to Spitzer and Hubble. It will be in the infrared, and it will allow us to see light from the first stars and first galaxies. And it will allow us to really understand atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn-like planets around other nearby stars. So we can't wait. It's been over 15 years, almost 20 years since we've been developing this observatory. So I'm so excited because the research that I've done of understanding galaxies has been good to about 7 billion years back in cosmic time. With James Webb, we will be able to push it to the beginning of time. That is incredible. And I'm sure you are just on the edge of your seat waiting for that data to start streaming back. Awesome. So um, before we end the episode, I want to challenge the students to a mission. So if uh, they are more interested in learning about the cosmos and how our supercomputers process that data, there's actually an activity that's put out by the James Webb Telescope folks. And we'll drop that link in the chat for you. And um, I want you to share your work with us on social networks at hashtag NextGenSTEM. And then tomorrow, we are so excited because this is also Education Appreciation Week. We have astronaut Ricky Arnold, who actually used to be an educator, a high school teacher, will be talking with us tomorrow at 2 p.m. So uh, stay tuned for that special episode. And before we say goodbye, Dr. Sheth, 
would you like to share any parting words with the students that may be watching with us today? Well, I just want to say I can't believe the half hour went by so quickly. I wish I could have had made more time for your questions, but feel free to write to us. We are always happy to get questions and respond to the students. And just remember, you know, if you love science, um, there, there, just chase your passion, whatever you're excited about, because there's so much to discover in this world, not just out in the cosmos, but in the oceans, on our planet itself. And I can't, and we need you, you know, we need you for um, the next generation and generations of discovery. And that's what really allows us to thrive as, as human beings and on this planet. So I look forward to seeing all of you in my spot five, 10, 15 years from now as the next NASA STEM star. All right. Thank you so much, Kartik. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And we'll see you again next time, STEM fans.